everybody. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome um, to uh, Barbie Tootie this afternoon. And this is Eric Appelt going to talk to us about dog strings. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, just a word about me. Uh, I have been uh, working with Python professionally for about uh, four years, the first as a software engineer and now as a Linux systems administrator at Vanderbilt's Acre facility. Uh, what we do is provide a centralized computing infrastructure for Vanderbilt researchers as a co-op where they share hardware. Uh, we provide education and optimize scientific software stack and other resources. We're a small team and we are short one systems administrator. So if this sounds something that's really cool and you like science, talk to me after the talk. But I did not come to uh, sell research computing. I came here to sell doc strings. Um, what this talk r grew out of is my frustration with myself when I would teach intro Python seminars and I would tell the students about what doc strings were and then I'd say they were really important but I don't think I really got across to them why they were really important. So this is what I would say. A doc string is just a string literal that occurs as the first statement of a function, definition, or a module, or a class, or a method in Python. And what's special about it is it becomes a special attribute of that function. Well, the under, underscore, underscore, doc, underscore, underscore. And what happens is on the, uh, if you're on the uh, interactive, <coughs> if you run Python interactively and call help and give it the function as an argument, it will format and print out that doc string. So having said that to everyone, from that, it really doesn't follow why this is an extremely important thing to always do, which is something that I've come to believe. So I've thought about this at some length and tried to present an argument, and here it is. So to argue for this, I need some example code to work with. Um, uh, and so this is a function that sorts a list of ducks. It's called sort ducks. It's sort of a modified bubble sort. It will loop over those, uh, the list of ducks uh, and then have a nested two loops and it will start looking at the height of the ducks and uh, it will create a new list and return it with the uh, <clears throat> sorted in ascending order by height. So this uh, graphic is unfortunately uh, very misleading. It shows the opposite of what this function will do. It should be the shortest duck to the tallest duck in order. Okay, so if you're new to Python, um, you, this is, would be your first example of a doc string. I have a triple quoted string as the first statement, and um, now we have a descriptive statement saying approximately what this function will do. So sure, that whole thing about being uh, in the help system is nice, but why is this such a big deal? And really, how does this result in a lot better code? And is this just sort of a special glorified comment and nothing more? Um, I think in a, some sense it is pretty much a glorified comment, but it is a very good comment. So what I want to do is talk about comments. Back, well, I think when I took a, a computer science, I didn't take a lot of classes in school and program, but I remember they told me I had to comment my code. And if I didn't, they'd take off points. And I, I remember it used to be, and I'm not sure, I think it still is, that people will say that professional code has comments, period. And code should be well commented. It should have a lot of comments. But I also see opinions online saying, look, we don't need a lot of comments. If you write your code well, it should be readable, and you shouldn't even use comments at all. I actually see the complete opposite statement. So what I'm going to do is explore each of these viewpoints and uh, go through their reasoning and go through where, where you run into difficulty. And from there, go into say how using doc strings really solves both these problems. So the thesis is, to comment. Why to comment? And I think the reason that you must comment here is because when people really begin to code, they code like this. It's a tangled mess. And when I say really begin to code, I don't mean, you know, doing simple examples or homework exercises. I mean making a project. It could be something for uh, a company. It could be just a text adventure game you're writing, but really pushing the limits of what you can do, maintaining, expanding that code, it's gonna become a mess. And if you have a big mess, 
a big mess with some comments with breadcrumbs of how to follow the tangled web is a lot better than a giant mess with no comments. So therefore, let's comment. So imagine a world without doc strings. I know it's scary, but or imagine if we didn't have doc strings, we might comment uh, this function like this and say, given a list of ducks, we'll return a new list of the ducks sorted by height using uh, something of a bubble sort algorithm. It's not exactly the textbook bubble sort, but it's got the same performance. Um, so this is, I think, a fairly useful comment. Uh, but when people are told that they have to just add a lot of comments to their code, we get behavior like this. I call this the play-by-play. -play. And a lot of times, if you tell new programmers that they've got to really well comment their code, well, then they'll say exactly what each statement does in English. Then we make a copy of the list of ducks, and we loop over the ducks. So we loop over the ducks above x, we swap ducks. And if you know Python well, this is just repeating the obvious. I do think there is a situation where these comments are potentially useful, and that's when you're on um, some team or organization that, for whatever reason, is forced to use a different language that nobody knows for one specific thing. And if no one even knows the language, then that's really helpful. Uh, in my last job, we had a chat bot that was written in CoffeeScript. And I had to make some modifications. And I don't know CoffeeScript, and no one on our team knew CoffeeScript. So really just commenting what every statement did was very helpful to everyone in that limited case. A lot of times you get comments that have metadata. Um, and I think way back before revision control and GitHub was very common, this was actually more useful than it is now. Again, there are limited places where this is useful, like if you're putting a code snippet on a, a sharing on a site and you want your authorship to be copied with it, that might be useful. But so we'll have the function renamed again, uh, what programming language it's intended to be used for, uh, who wrote it, and when. This metadata can become endless at times, indicating who I am, what company I work for, for whatever reason, what division I'm in, and the date. Sometimes you get inline change histories. And I've seen this a lot, and it happens. Again, if for whatever reason you can't use revision control, this, might, this can be helpful. But yeah, if you have a code that's in revision control, this is superfluous. Uh, but it's there. We can have future plans to do. We want to convert this to a faster merge sort algorithm. And then often comments end up with false starts and uh, code that's no longer used but commented out for posterity because you don't want to lose it, even though it's in revision control. Um, so this somewhat we have started to try to write a merge sort, and we've sort of just uh, left that effort for later. Or maybe we just got really frustrated <laughs> doing it. And so we've left this comment indicating my, my feelings, my personal feelings about the merge sort algorithm and my difficulty coding it. We get lots of other kinds of comments. Example usage, OK, that can be useful. Uh, unprofessionalism, just insulting each other, that's no good. ASCII art, that's fun. Uh, operational lore, why this took down the infrastructure last December. Uh, leftover debug signposts. Uh, sometimes you just get lots of hash marks, you know, just to, to break things up, to create walls and, you know, visual spacing. So, uh, yeah, demarcating various points in the code. Now you can have uh, inspirational quotes, directives to the linter or other robots that will be sweeping through the code. So there's a lot that comments can be. And I think this is one of the difficulty of when you tell people, comment your code well, you're kind of telling them to do all this stuff, some of which you, maybe you don't want them to do. I want to go over the counter argument, the antithesis. Don't use comments. And the typical way I've seen this argument is I hear the, I've heard the phrase several times, comments are a code smell. In other words, if you had to use a comment, that meant your code was not readable on its own. It was not clear. And so in order to make up for that lack of immediate clarity, you had to add some explaining comment. And the idea is that the more one can write better or cleaner code, this reduces the need for commenting, or in the extreme case, one might argue, that you don't need to comment at all. Now, by better, cleaner code, um, the book uh, Clean Code comes to mind by Robert, uh, Robert Martin. 
Yeah, yeah, I remember. Uh, which is a good book to read. And some of the, uh, but some of the arguments from there and other places are you want to keep your functions small and concise and write functions generally that do one thing and do it well. You want to avoid side effects. That means functions take some arguments and return a value, but as much as possible, we want most of your functions or methods not to be going out to the outside world and you know, updating databases, writing files, uh, turning off your refrigerator. Um, so avoid that as much as you can. Um, and you want to use really descriptive function names. They have to be very good names. Seriously, use really good names because this is going to describe what the function does. And remember, we're not commenting here. So this is a hard task. And um, uh, there's a quote attributed to Phil Carlton. There are only two hard things in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. So let me go back to our example. Is this a good name? Is it clear and self-descriptive? Can we deduce the behavior of this function from its name? Well, maybe. What property are we sorting on? Well, I thought it's obvious that you sort ducks by height, right? That's just what you do, and that's what everyone on the team agrees. But Anna has come, and, and she's joined the team, and she's from the civil engineering discipline. And apparently in civil engineering, you always sort ducks by weight. So this was a very confusing function. It did not do what she thought it was going to do. So who knew? So maybe we should call it sort ducks by height. Um, Bob, in uh, business intelligence, tried to sort a list of 15 billion ducks, and it took forever because this is an inefficient sort algorithm. We thought that's an implementation detail, but maybe we should add that this is a sort of modified bubble sort so that people would know that it runs slow. Other people will argue, hey, the runtime is really an implementation detail, but is it? We can argue this for a while. Are we sorting the list in place? Or are we creating a new list, right? Is the original list going to be modified and sorted, or do we just leave that alone and return a new list? Well, this one doesn't sort it in place, um, and so maybe we could rewrite it to say that. I know some languages have like a, um, a thing where you do an exclamation point if something's going to modify what's going in. Uh, we can't really do that in Python. If you have type hint hinting, this helps a little bit. Uh, so if you've enabled type hinting with MyPy, then you could say that we're specifically taking a list of ducks and we're returning a list of ducks. That probably means we're making a new one, but you can't really be sure because some people like to do um, method chaining and will return uh, the input value as a convenience so you can chain off more uh, method calls. Okay. So this is hard. It reminds me of a hard problem in computability theory, the halting problem. And the halting problem is the problem of determining from the description of an arbitrary computer program in an input whether the program will finish running or continue to run on forever. Um, and in 1936, I believe, the brilliant scientist Alan Turing determined that you cannot create a general algorithm to determine if something will halt. Um, so I believe there's a similar halting problem in software engineering. And here the halting problem is determining whether you have a pull request for a new arbitrary function, whether the reviewers will converge on a consensus on what to name this thing, i.e. halt, or will they continue the discussion forever? So this is very hard. And we've placed a lot on naming if you're not going to use comments to further describe it. Here's another problem with, with trying to write clean code is generally, honestly, in the real world, when we continue to really code, we code like this. Even after you've learned all these nice design patterns, and the reason is you've got deadlines, right? Uh, management sees a prototype that you're going to rewrite, but hey, we've got to make money, and we're behind. Let's just dump this into production and hope for the best. We have to take on technical debt. We'll solve it later. Or my favorite is you get a new team lead. He's, the team lead, uh, he or she is great and she has come up with a new design pattern that's going to solve everything. We start refactoring, we get about halfway through, and then she gets a better job and she leaves. So the new team lead comes in and he's got great ideas. And he, we're going to read with these new design patterns, it's going to make everything better. So we start to refactor the code and we get about a third of the way through and then he's gone. So we have all these competing design patterns and any one of them would have been fantastic, but instead you've got a mess. Um, so, and again, when you have a mess, having some comments is helpful. So, 
writing clean code is hard, um, getting the right commenting is hard. Um, and so what I want to do is now synthesize these two arguments where we go on, and I hold that the doc string can get us what we want in terms of taking that uh, difficulty off of writing good name, reducing the pressure on naming things, and giving us some structure in how we should comment to make the comments useful. So we live in an unclean world, but we want clean-ish code. So we could try to write smallish functions. We'll try the best we can to name the functions well in the time you have. But you have to accept that you can't quickly converge on a great name, that from the name you know what the function does. It describes all the arguments, the return values, describes any side effects, and states any restrictions on calling the function. That's a lot to do. But what you can do is you can do the best you can with the function name. And you can follow that statement with a special comment that summarizes the behavior of the function, documents the arguments, the return value, any exceptions it raised, documents all side effects, and states any restriction on when it can be called. Well, in Python, that is exactly what you do with the doc string. And this laundry list of things that a doc string should have is part of a document called PAP257, or Python Enhancement Protocol 257. This is, I like to think of, um, as PEP8's younger cousin. PEP8 is the official Python style guide. If you haven't seen it, definitely Google PEP8 Python and give it a read. It's good. And then go Google PEP257, because PEP257 gives guidelines on writing good doc strings. So let's go back to getting our ducks in a row here. I will add a PEP257, I hope, compliant doc string. So what does sort ducks do? It returns a new list of ducks sorted by height. So I have this first line is a, a brief summary. And then I'll say exactly what it does. It takes a list of ducks as an argument, creates a duplicate list, sorts the new list in ascending order by height, and returns the new list. And I'll, I can add a note here about this thing, which is arguably or arguably not an implementation detail. This is a slow algorithm, so I'll just, I'll just make a note of that in the doc string. And I can do that. So naming is hard, but doc stringing is relatively easy. It's just hard to write a function that does all these things in one line or just a couple words. But it's easier to write a paragraph explaining all that. This property is well known in literature. Shakespeare said, brevity is the soul of wit. And Mark Train wrote something of the form, I didn't have the time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long one instead. Because it is really hard to say something meaningful in such a concise way. This is basically poetry. When we ask people to write, make function or method names that describe everything about them, we're asking them to write master level poetry in addition to solving real world programming challenges. Um, in fact, this talk is very similar. I was very hesitant in submitting this talk um, because I felt that if I had time and if I was better at this, I could make this a lightning talk. This should be five minutes. But I'm just not smart enough to figure it out, and I don't have time to figure out how to make it short. So here we all are spending an entire 30 minutes of our lives. So sorry about that. <laughs> now, doc strings, I think, can help with encapsulation. Encapsulation is you hide implementation details within a class or within a module especially in Python. Now, Python doesn't have public or private declarations. Um, there's nothing stopping you from using hidden or private attributes. The way you do it in Python is you just put a func an underscore in front of the method or function name. And then we all just agree as adults that we'll never, ever call that outside of the class or the method. <laughs> and then, I mean, okay, so on Thursday, I, I did that. Uh, I mean, but um, we should. We should leave things that are private as private. So, one thing about encapsulation is, under normal circumstances, you just mark something as public, and it's public. What you can do is require a comprehensive set 257 compliant doc string if you're going to make something public. And if it doesn't have that nice doc string, you give it an underscore. And I think this really helps, because making something public 
having a function or a method that's going to be used globally throughout your code base uh, is more than just saying you're going to do it. You have to create a full doc string, which means you are requiring a clear specification, almost a contract of what that function is supposed to do. <clears throat> so anything leaving its own environment that can be called throughout your software library or application has a contract on their behavior. And if it's not fully specified, that means it has no visibility outside the behavior. I think this really improves code. And I think it's improved my code when I force myself to write a real comprehensive doc string like anything that I'm going to call outside of a logic. <clears throat> Another thing I think is useful is what I'm calling doc string to do driven development. Um, one perhaps unfair and small summary of test-driven development is you can describe it as writing tests first. So doc string driven development is writing doc strings first. Start each function or method with a clear specification. Make that contract for a behavior and that automatically determines really what tests you want to write. Once you know all the properties of the function, and it determines the implementation constraints. And I believe that writing doc strings first and trying to come up with functions for which you can write a fairly simple doc string leads to cleaner code. That is, it's easier to write a doc string for a function if it really just does one thing, if it doesn't have a lot of side effects. And it, it's short in some sense in terms of what it does. It's intended behavior, not that complex. Um, so if it's hard to write a doc string, that's a good sign to maybe think to factor what you're trying to do. Another thing that's really cool with testing is you can incorporate tests into a doc string. There's a great li there's a library in the standard in the Python standards library called Docker. And what, what this does is if I have my uh, doc string, I can put some example usage and format it like a Python interactive interpreter with the uh, triple rate event, and Docop will actually parse this statement of um, sorting the ducks and ensure that this function does what it says it does in the doc string. So uh, if I don't get that as a result, uh, the sorted list of my original ducks, then I'll get an error. So this is nice. Not only do you have documentation right with the source code, it is documentation that's guaranteed uh, to do what, what it says it does. Uh, another thing that I use heavily is Sphinx, uh, which allows you to generate docu external documentation using the doc strings. What this means is that your documentation for a function is right beside the code. Now this is an example function from our assistant administrative library, where this sends a simple text message to our Slack one of our, for our organizational Slack. And it's a convenience function. <clears throat> and I've used Sphinx formatting to describe each one of the, uh, uh, each, each one of the uh, arguments to this function. And what happens when you plug, put it through Sphinx, you can build out HTML pages, and the one for this function looks like this. And it has a link to the source code. Anytime I change the function, Again, I'm only human, but hopefully I'll change the doc string, which is right above it, um, if it needs to be changed. And that change will immediately then be propagated uh, to my new documentation. So if I add a new key optional keyword op argument, and I'm smart about it, or uh, my team members review it and say, hey, add that into the doc string, it goes to the documentation. In my opinion, this is easier to remember to do because it's right there. When you have fully external documentation, then it's, it becomes a truly separate step. <clears throat> there are even tools to integrate both testing in like doc op style and Sphinx. There's something called Civil I've actually started using it, where you can write code blocks in your documentation, format your code for external documentation, and then test all the examples right there and make sure that they're all still valid. Okay, so the last thing I want to say is this really is not a Python talk. Doc strings are a property that I started using when I started uh, writing, when I, when I moved from being um, a, a research scientist that sort of wrote 
Python to help my research, and not really professionally for a software engineer. My mentor helped me out. The first thing he did is say, hey, your code has no doc strings in it. You can't work on my team until you've done that. So he made me go through and I have a whole code base with doc strings on it. So I use doc strings because I use Python and it's there, but um, before I used a lot of Python, I wrote a lot of C++, and I've been thinking ever since that, man, if I had put doc strings on every function in C++, my code would have been a lot better. I would have written better C++. Now, I haven't written C++ in a while, so I don't know. I didn't actually run this to see if it works. Uh, but I think it works. And so I've added a doc string. Now, C++ is a language that no doc string support. But I looked around and I saw that there are libraries that allow you to do things. Like, you see this extra exclamation point? Slash, I'm not extra, extra asterisk. Slash asterisk starts a comment in C or C++. You don't need two, but you can add a second one to denote to whoever cares that, ah, this is a special comment. And so you can add on systems that instead of compiling code, can pull this out and write documentation based on this. And I think this is a good idea. Um, in particular, the flow of this. I've seen systems like this where the description string is above the function declaration, but I like it right below the function declaration. Because that puts the emphasis on that call signature, on that function name, which really is still the most important thing, but it needs to be followed uh, by your description. So, in conclusion, I recommend reading PEP 257 for good, good doc string practices. Um, using the uh, doc strings that have that information creates an effective contract for function behavior and documents it at the same time. Uh, it's, um, integrating doc strings into external doc documentation really helps keep that documentation up to date. I recommend try writing the doc string first. It's definitely helped me. And it helps to guide testing. Again, cleaner code is easier to doc string. So if I'm writing a function and I'm having a hard time parsing out what its doc string should be, maybe I should rethink that. So. Thank you, and write doc strings. You can find me at, uh, on Twitter, um, A-P-P-E-L-T-E-L, -E -E on GitHub. Um, Twitter, my Twitter is mostly pictures of birds, but there is some Python stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Want to see pictures of birds? I like them, so. Um, <clears throat> Did you take that picture? I do, I take pictures of birds. Yeah. Okay.